like that peace. Let it begin with me. May we be in prayer. Oh, holy God, we do long for your peace. We trust in your promise. We hear your call for us to turn to you, to change our lives, and to welcome you into our hearts. So fill our minds with your wisdom and fill our hearts with your peace so that our worship together here today fills our hearts to do your will always. And in the name of the one who is coming, we all say, Amen. If you're able to stand, our opening hymn is It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Ellie help, helped us with the sound check today on this microphone, and I'm glad she did, because Ellie, come over here a second. We're sneaky. Come here. <laughs> we just wanted to acknowledge you today. Ellie's been, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie's been how long at this church? Forever and a day, just about. And Ellie, whenever there was a spot that needed done, something, a job or whatever, she was always first in line. She took over when Lucinda had to leave. And she's done a marvelous job. In fact, when I first started here, even, um, as the pastor, she put up with all of those crazy requests when we were making bulletins, and remember the ones with Superman pictures on the front and those types of things. She always found them. She rolled her eyes, but kept doing it. <laughs> but um, we have a special bond, and she has a special bond with every person in here. And she is probably the, one of the biggest ambassadors of this particular church because you love so many people, and you show that love every day. As you might know, Ellie is leaving us within a couple of weeks. Um, she's going out east to be with her family, and I think it's a wonderful move. She's, she's really troubled over this for the last almost a year, thinking about it, but she made the conclusion, and, the, and I'm grateful that she has, but I am very sad that we're going to lose you from this church. But she claims that she'll come back every now and then, and I think you better. Okay. And um, so... I would like Linda to come forward next. No, it's not a new car. <laughs> we got you this for as a little present. This is a gift card for uh, the TJ Maxx group because she loves going to the home store <laughs> and she's going to need things for her new place. So we have given her a, a So, Ellie has become like a sister to me, an older sister, <laughs> but still, 
but still a sister, right? So when Rich asked me to do this, I thought about all my Ellie stories and figured probably everyone here has an Ellie story, and some of which might be suitable to tell here in the church, but we don't have that much time. So then I thought about all of those things people say at times like these. She's our anchor. She's a light. She brings us joy. But again, there's just not enough time to go through all those. Plus, there just aren't enough words to express what she means to me, this church, and probably every one of you here. So, Ellie, we hope this will help with some of the changes you'll be making in your new home. But just know, as you begin the next chapter of your life, you are truly loved and will be missed by us. And God will be with you along with a piece of this church and a piece of our hearts. And somehow Ellie has missed out in the gathering area that there's this table set up with um, all kinds of goodies. So we're having a reception for you following the service today. So do stay and we'll have a wonderful celebration. Okay? God love you. Um, can the elders stand? And let's just say a brief prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, but we thank you for this, this person that I have my arm around, Ellie, Ellie Wells. She has been such a, um, a joy. She has been your light in this sanctuary, your light with this congregation. And those that are standing and those that are seated, dear Lord, we are all here to wish her the best. We ask for your arms to be wrapped around her, Keep her safe, keep her full of peace, keep her full of joy, and may she continue to spread your love in her new location. And we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Long ago, the people were given a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The words of Gabriel had to be confusing and frightening to Mary. Her response said it all. How can this be, she cried. I'm sure she didn't know what to imagine. I can't blame her, can you? But when Mary realized the truth of the angel's words and the fulfilling of God's promise, she didn't hesitate. She sang and praised God for this great privilege. God's anointed one will soon walk among us to lighten our darkness and to show his great love for us. We first relight the candle of hope, but then we add to it the light of the candle of peace. May their combined light remind us that God is peace and hope that can never be extinguished. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from the Old Testament, 
book of Micah. And uh, if you folks want to, uh, if you folks want to um, read along, it's in the Old Testament Micah book, page 865, in your pew Bibles. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are a small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. Um, there were no prayer requests in the bowl in the back. So if anybody has any requests from the congregation. And may we bow our head in prayer, please. Illuminating God who brings light in our darkness, whose word shows us the way, be with us on our Advent journey. Like Ruth, when our journey takes us to unfamiliar places and unknown people, bring us hope. We pray for those who face uncertainty in their lives, facing welcome and unwelcome change or difficult decisions. Guide them and us to see your purpose in our days and to find meaning in our confusion. Encourage us with signs of your presence in our lives. Like Micah, when our journey is beset by threats and we feel engulfed by upheaval, bring us peace. We pray for those whose lives are troubled by conflict and those who are living in fear. Help them and find us. Give us strength in unexpected places and release us from all that is causing us pain. Protect us with the reassurance of our value in your eyes. May you look after this congregation, O Lord, for we love you dearly, and we are so grateful for your son as we look upon his birth. And we pray for those for whom this Advent season is a time of sadness and for whom a celebration seems impossible this year. Comfort them and us with the reminder that we are each loved and treasured by you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. all of the children to come up here with me. And yes, Dale, you can come if you like. I forgot the most important thing.
Anybody know what this is? <laughs> a stocking. Is it hung by the, by the fireplace with care? Will be. It will be, though. You know, every year when I was just around your age, I always hung my stocking. I always looked for my dad's hunting socks because they were the biggest socks that you had. They were cool. And I would put one up on the fireplace on the mantel, and the next morning it was just overflowing with stuff. But you want to know something? Every time I opened it up, there were four things in that stocking. Every single time. It's kind of interesting. You know what it was? Oh, you peeked. <laughs> well, actually, wow, it's hard to get in there. There we go. Look at that. An orange. But then I would dig in deeper. You know what else what I would pull out? What do you think? What? Seeds? No. <laughs> An apple. And then I'd dig in a little even deeper. A lemon. <laughs> Sometimes coal. Candy. And then sometimes I would reach way down in the toes, and guess what was there? Oh, for crying out loud, look at that. What are those? Nuts. Well, that's nuts, isn't it? That was a joke. You may laugh. <laughs> and you want to know something? In two days, it's a special holiday for many people. And it's called St. Nicholas Day. Huh, who's St. Nicholas? Santa. 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 You bet. Well, I'm going to tell you a story real quick where Santa is called St. Nicholas. Do you know why? Because no. there was a pastor who... <laughs> long time ago he used to go all around Europe and he would um, he, he would go all around Europe and he would go to village to village and he loved children and what he did is he always had a big sack over his back sound familiar? Mm -hmm. yeah like Santa and he would walk into the town and he loved the children so much that he always gave them four gifts and guess what those gifts were? presents that they were these and because there were very few Bibles you know what he would do he used these things to teach Bible stories to the children he would take an orange and he would hold it up and he said what does that look like to you what does it look like an orange <laughs> I love it also if it was hung up way in the sky what would it look like the sky What's in the sky? Cloud, cloud. No, the bright yellowy sun. Thing. The sun, right. <laughs> <laughs> and what he would say is, at the very beginning, God created light, which is the sun. And so whenever you have an orange, you're to remember the Bible verse that God created light because all of our lives would not exist without light. That's a special gift, isn't it? But then he would pull out an apple. Good-looking apple, isn't it? Yeah, it still has a sticker on it, but... What color is it? Red. Red, isn't it? Do you know what the story was about the apple? He would say, Jesus died for us. Jesus gave his life for us. <coughs> Jesus shed his blood for us. And what color is the blood? Now, if I gave you this apple and you took a great big bite out of it, what color's inside? Um, um, more tan. More, we'll, we'll use yours. Yellow. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> you said white. White. Say it again. White. Yeah, and inside the apple is, you're making this hard. <laughs> but inside, if you take this bite, it's a white. And what does that white represent? That Jesus is pure. He had no faults. Isn't that something? Just by eating an apple, you'll remember this. And then he would hold up these. Just some nuts. He always had, there was some nuts. Have you ever seen what a squirrel does with nuts? They eat them. They, they hide them, don't they? 
they put him somewhere. You know, Mrs. Pate, um, just yesterday, she heard somebody, she thought, knocking at our front door. And we have a big pine cone wreath on our front door. There was a squirrel in the wreath trying to take some of the nut. He was trying to hide a walnut in the wreath. <laughs> but you know what that means? When, when the snows are deep, okay, when it's really deep and cold, the squirrels know where they hid these. And so they can go and find them and stay alive and have a meal. So you see, that's wisdom. And that's what these represent, wisdom. And that's what Jesus and God gives us. If we read his book and understand, he gives us wisdom. And then the last thing he gave, he did not give Reese's peanut butter cups. They weren't invented yet. But it's sugar. And what was really special, everything back then, thousand years ago and more, they always used honey for the sweetener. But there was something really special about white sugar. And he would have little bitty small amounts and give this to the children. Do you know why? It was very rare. And when something's rare, do you know what they call it? A treasure. A treasure. So this was a treasure to all the children to remind them that everything that God tells us is a treasure. Aren't those special little gifts? Aren't they great? And that's what everybody will celebrate this Tuesday. That's St. Nicholas Day. And Santa Claus heard about St. Nicholas a long time ago and went, what a cool idea. So I'm going to make sure these things are in everybody's stocking every year to remind them of those four Bible stories. Pretty cool, huh? Well, back there, there is a sack for each of you with an apple and an orange in it. So you can take those home, too, all right? All righty. Thanks for coming up. And speaking of gifts, <laughs> the greatest gift that's been given to us is what we celebrate from this table every, every Sunday when we come together, and that's communion, where Jesus reminds us that he gave his body and gave his blood, gave his life for you and for I, for me, for us. So let's um, just settle back for a moment or two contemplate in what Jesus has done for us and these marvelous gifts that God has given us, the sunlight, the, 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 the perfect sun, and the perfect sun, S-O-N. And he gave us wisdom, and he gave us such a treasure. And as we contemplate those things, let us uh, sing our communion hymn, Peace Like a River.
is on the horizon. Weary world, behold, you promised Messiah. Let your song begin. Here comes heaven. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Here comes heaven. Sinner, wait no. Love has broken the silence. Come, let us adore. Your Savior is with us. Angels, let your song begin. Here comes heaven. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Here comes heaven. Here comes For I receive from the Lord that which I now pass on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took a simple loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body for you. So each do this in remembrance of me. And then... In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying that this cup is now the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until that glorious day when he returns. Amen.
Luke, 17, Luke 1, excuse me, 26 to 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Jan just read, in the sixth month. The sixth month of what? Of course, Elizabeth's pregnancy. We ended on the fifth month, if you recall, last week, where no one has even known except she and her husband that she is pregnant. But now when this starts, what's happened is there's a next tick of our Advent clock. We are approaching, quickly approaching, this Advent what is coming for us. So let's continue our story. Now, if you weren't careful when you heard what Jan read, you might have heard that in that, uh, that Mary is of the house of David. That's actually wrong. Joseph, her betrothed, is one from the house of David. Mary, on the other hand, is more likely to be a Levite, like Elizabeth, her relative. But regardless, it is by grace it is by her character that Mary joins the genealogy of the Messiah. Hebrew gene uh, genealogies rarely mention women. In fact, almost never. But in the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew, four women are mentioned. And not one of them is included because of their own birth. So let's hear this genealogy of Jesus that's been recorded by Matthew. Matthew 1, 1 through 6 and 16. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamra. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uri's wife. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So did you hear the names of the four women? There was Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and actually the name wasn't there, Bathsheba, but it was noted as the wife of Uriah. But each one of these women becomes the matriarchs of Jesus, not by birth, but by their very character. And through God's grace, and this is the sisterhood that Mary is about to enter, each one displays this very specific trait and we can learn something of each one of these traits. Traits that are also going to help Mary live in a world that is both broken and unkind. So let's take a look at each of these four women for a few moments. There's Tamar. She's a Canaanite. She is married to Judah's oldest son, Ur. Ur was a very evil man, but he died young. And there were no children. So by law, Tamar must marry the next youngest son. And he did not want to marry her because he also was an evil man. So Judah had a third son who was very, very young, so he sends Tamar back to be with her family until this youngest son is of age that he would be able to marry Tamar and possibly produce a son. But because of this, the time goes by, and she was forgotten, actually, for many years. 
But one day, Judah was traveling in the very vicinity of where Tamar and her family lived, and she heard about it. So she dresses herself as a temple prostitute and goes and waits along the side of the road by one of the, uh, the temples. Judah comes along, meets her, barters for her, and as payment, Tamar requests that he give her his signet ring, a cord, and his staff. Judah leaves without recognizing his own daughter-in-law. Now, a few months go by. Judah hears that Tamar is pregnant. He becomes belligerent, and he said she must be killed because she has disgraced the family. He calls for her to appear before him, and she appears and says, Judah, I am with child by the owner of these things, and she hands him back his ring. Oh, my and also the cord and the staff. What a dangerous moment that is. Think about that moment. What courage this woman must have had to do that. And in that very moment, Judah grows up, if you will. And he realizes that he has neglected his duty to his daughter-in-law. And yet she fulfilled the duty on her own. What was Judah's response? She is more faithful than I. You see, Tamar shows us that we need to be cunning, we need to be courageous in a world that is truly spinning out of control. And Mary is also, will be, a very courageous woman. Then there's Rahab. Rahab is a citizen of Jericho. Now, before they cross the Jordan, Joshua sends ahead a few spies to go into Jericho and to look around to see the fortifications. The king of Jericho hears about this and sends his soldiers out to kill these spies. Rahab, who is a citizen of Jericho, she finds the two men and hides them on the roof of her house. She gives these men a safe place to stay, uh, to stay a place of protection. In fact, she gives them, because she covered them, she gives them a room. The irony of this is, and I love the old names in the Bible, because the name Rahab actually means room. She gives them a simple room that protects them, protects these men who would lead Israel over the Jordan and into the Promised Land. Rahab provided a room of protection Mary will be the room for Jesus. And what does it tell us? That each of us should always make room in our hearts for Jesus. Then there's Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. She is a sweet, gentle, faithful woman. She traveled to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi, after the death of her husband, who was Naomi's son. She was obedient to her mother-in-law, and she was gracious to Naomi's kinsman, Boaz. Ruth and Boaz fall in love. They marry, and they have a son. And this son would grow to become Jesse, the grandfather of David, who was to become king. You see, Ruth was faithful and obedient to Naomi. Mary will be faithful and obedient to God. Can we be anything less and obedient to a God who comes to us and loves us so. And finally, there's Bathsheba. She joins this ancestry of the Messiah the way that Tamar and Ruth did, through suffering and through loss. Bathsheba is taken advantage of by her king, who then has her husband Uriah killed. Bathsheba is pregnant by this king, But then the child dies, and she grieves at that death. But then Bathsheba witnesses the very change in David from a sinner to becoming the very anointed one of God. And she's lived through suffering. She's lived through loss. But now she sees and she is there to witness her second son by the name of Solomon to rise to rule the kingdom through the grace and majesty of God. Mary will also find cruelty and suffering and even majesty with the crucifixion of her son. 
We must also understand that we will, too, in our own lives, be torn between suffering and grace. We've all been there. You see, the very name of Jesus brings us not only hatred in a cruel and harsh world, but it brings us forgiveness that can transform our hearts. What a name. Name above all names. So what have we learned from these four outstanding women? We also need to be cunning and courageous in this world. We need to become a room in which Jesus can dwell. We need to be gentle and faithful, as well as accepting suffering and loss. Mary did. So should we. Luke 1, 28 to 30. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. I don't know if you heard those two words or not. Greatly troubled, (laughs) you think? (laughs) It's interesting, though. Mary's reaction to the angel's greeting must absolutely be part of our Advent anticipation. In the very presence of holy things, holy things of God, we also should be and need to be greatly troubled. Look at Isaiah. He saw the seraphim. He was in the very throne room of God. Their cries of holy, holy, holy were all around the room. And what did he say? I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. That greatly troubled. Moses, after speaking with God, comes down from the mountain and he had to put a veil over his face because his face glowed so much from the very presence of God. And it caused fear in the hearts of the people. They were greatly troubled. Fear. Fear of the Lord, sorry to say, has been forgotten, both by the world and even many of its believers. The angels of today are cute, chubby babies, or they're elegant women with flowing gowns and beautiful wings. Am I right? That's a far cry from the seraphim in Isaiah, or this fiery vision of Gabriel with Zechariah, and now Mary. This lack of fear in our world is not a sign of character of God, but it's a sign of the lack of character of our present age. And also, it's also a sign that shows our arrogance and our ignorance towards the belief and understanding of who our God truly is. Think about that. More and more, our secular celebrations of Christmas are taking over in our world, are they not? Celebrations that are no more meaningful than an excuse to buy and sell and to get and to give. And a lot of it, in fact, most of it is without a single thought of God or Jesus. But if you think about what the world's been doing, if God is nothing more than a jolly old elf in a red suit, then what is there ever to be afraid of in the world? What else could cause us to be greatly troubled? In a growing secular society, secular arrogance claims there is no God. Therefore, the true meaning of Christmas is reduced to just a season to show an occasional human kindness. And then this secular ignorance confuses the creation with its creator. It worships the earth. It worships trees. Even worships the universe. It believes in material things, and what does it do? It replaces God with itself. So the question is, how can there be any fear in a world with no God? Those two can't coexist. If there's no God, then there is no need to bridge this gulf between the mortal and the immortality. So sin, you see, wouldn't matter. As Christian believers, we should know better, though, should we not? But do we? Because we fall for some of the things of the world every day. Do we fear angels any more than the rest of the world? 
Do we assume in our own arrogance that we deserve grace, that we deserve blessing, that we deserve the gift of salvation? You've heard me say a number of times here that I really dislike the word deserve. We deserve nothing. You see, we can't be thankful or joyful for any gift that we think we deserve of. That gift that God gives us, we don't deserve, but it's there for the taking. And further, in our ignorance, do we forget that without this little baby Jesus, that there would be no forgiveness. There would be no salvation. There would be no mercy. You see, we really need to be careful in our lives day to day. Without this little baby Jesus, life would have absolutely no meaning. Nothing. This child is the very light, the very light of God. And the light shines us, and it shows us the way. But in John 3.18, Jesus tells Nicodemus and us that the world loves darkness because their deeds are evil. This is why we need that light. We need to examine ourselves. We need to be humble. We need to be truthful with ourselves. And if we do, and if we're honest with ourselves, we should also, like Mary, be greatly troubled every day. Because when that angel appears... Even as we shake with fear, we could at least now acknowledge and rejoice that we hear the light say, do not be afraid. If we don't know those things, we'll never miss it. Jesus said, I have come not to punish, but to give you life. I am the Savior born for you. Think about that. Isn't this Advent, isn't this Christmas, this thing that we're going through? It's the most wonderful thing in the world. That in a world of darkness, a world of hate and greed, the light brings life. And it all changes with the birth of a little child. Luke 1, 31 to 33. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Gabriel's first words to Mary announce about the child that is to come. And Mary asks, who is he? What sort of a savior is approaching us? What is this mercy that is to be born among us? And the angel answers, he shall be a king. The king promised to God, by God, to David over a thousand years earlier. He says he shall be a king like not like David, but a king to fulfill all that David represented. David was a king. He was a mortal king and with mortal parents. His reign had a beginning as well as an ending, but this new king will have no such boundaries because he said, for of his kingdom there will be no end. No end. Think about that. We talk about it eternal, but that's what it means. God is now looking into that eternal. This son of Mary will also be the only begotten son of the Most High. And Gabriel's words have even a deeper meaning. He says the Messiah is coming. In the Messiah shall be the house of God, and in that house it will be built. In the Messiah, goodness will finally arise to rule the world. And in the Messiah, we shall find a place of peace. This is who is to come. This is our Savior. You shall call his name Jesus, he said. For you see, Jesus is our mercy. Luke 1, 34 to 37. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you. 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I don't know about you, but I think Mary asks a very reasonable question here. She says, how can this be? She receives an answer that exceeds all of our comprehension and reason. The angel's answer is that through God, their creator, nothing is impossible. By the promise of God, the old woman, Elizabeth, conceives. You see, with God, nothing is impossible. But even that miracle with Elizabeth diminishes next to this miracle. That by the promise of God, a virgin shall and will conceive. John is to be born of Elizabeth, and John will be less than the one born of the virgin. John prepares the way. Jesus is the way. John's parents are both human. The father of Jesus is God. And that is exactly, that is precisely the very essence of Gabriel's answer to Mary. And that is the meaning of this brief exchange between the two. Mary's human question and Gabriel's heavenly response tells us that Jesus is both. He is human, as fully human as his mother, and he is at the same time as divine as his father, the Most High God. And from this great paradox comes the very foundation of our Christian faith. And without it, our truth, our belief, would only be human, something temporary, something that can end. And a Christmas that is reduced to anything less is no Christmas at all. So now we see the words of John 1 actually revealed to us. The word which was in the beginning was with God and was God, became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Luke 1.38 I am the servant's, the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Don't you wish you could be like Mary, as pure a disciple, as trusting, as understanding, and as willing? Oh, Mary, the mother of our Lord, you were invited to join a sisterhood with Tamar and Bathsheba, a sisterhood of sorrow and human suffering, because your child will soon attract the hatred and outrage of an evil and dark world. And oh, Mary, you said yes. You were asked to serve faithfully on behalf of others, like Rahab, to protect a few for the sake of many, and like Ruth, to turn disappointment into joy. And, oh, Mary, you said yes. It was an angel who spoke to you, a fiery inhabitant of heaven who stands in the very presence of God, whose flaming glory darkens the common world in which you, Mary, lived. Yet you did not flinch. You did not hesitate. You showed no fear, no horror. You just said, yes. The whole history of Israel is about to be poured into you, a single, lone, young woman. And you are going to carry and give birth to the son of David, and he, your son, would keep every past promise that's been made by God. And you said, yes. The angel asked, will you be the door of the Lord into this place? And Mary, you said, yes. 2,000 years before Mary, another woman heard an angel declare that she would bear a son. Sarah was 90 years of age, and she laughed. And her reaction to this impossible promise? A scornful snort. <laughs> to Sarah, the angel said, exactly the same words that Gabriel said to Mary. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Oh, <laughs> sweet, innocent Mary, 
Your reaction was completely opposite to all of those before you. Your answer to a promise more impossible than Sarah's or to your cousin Elizabeth was an answer of complete obedience and faith. You said, let it happen to me according to your word. You, the very first of disciples of Jesus, Mary, you and you alone said yes. May we pray? Hmm. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the faith of a young maiden in whose obedience your plan for the reconciliation of the whole world was begun. We ask that you might empower us in pure simplicity. Teach us to make a single response to whatever task that you set before us. And may our response always be yes. Amen. Next week we're going to take a look at the moment when two expectant mothers meet. If you're able to stand, let us uh, join our voices together in our closing hymn. Let there be peace on earth. So go, therefore, in the name of the triune God, walking in his light and sharing in the spirit of hope. Go with joy and thanksgiving in your hearts to live in Christ our Savior. Amen. Go in peace and let us join together in a reception for Ellie.